Governor Lamb, for many of us in Colorado, is an iconic figure. Um, and uh, we were just talking before he started about a famous moment uh, in his career that he said in the end turned out to be a good thing, but it didn't feel like it probably day one, where he was quoted as saying, Americans have a duty or a responsibility to die. And that's why Sarah's coming to talk about the death panels, so you will, <laughs> I'm sure, enjoy the conversation. But uh, uh, he is now a director of the Center for Public Policy and Contemporary Issues at the University of Denver. He was our governor for three terms, 12 years, and um, has always been a leader in kind of independent thinking. In fact, I'm, I apologize for this, Governor. I don't even know if you're a Democrat or Republican. We just think of you as a governor. So uh, with that, I'll introduce you. Pat, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Um, let me take that theme and just <laughs> go forward. Um, I, I, I really would like to do everything for everybody that medical science has invented. You know, the only problem is I don't live in such a world. Um, so here's what I would suggest, painfully but inevitably, we have to come to, that no nation can build a healthcare system a patient at a time. Uh, that no citizen in, this, uh, in, in any society, anywhere, can expect all uh, the medical technologies that healthcare has uh, developed uh, to, to be provided that no physician can practice their profession assuming that they're the unrestrained advocate of every patient. That no citizen can expect and no nation or health plan can ever afford to give the Hippocratic Oath a blank check. That public policy cannot live with the concept that we can give everybody all the health care that they need and that rationing is inevitable. In fact, I think desirable. You're never going to maximize the health of any society that are sp spending public funds until somebody asks that rationing question, how do we get the most health care for the limited dollars that we have? I believe that not only is the Oregon health priority system ethical, I think it's eth unethical for a state not to ha set priorities. Whoever budgets, whoever allocates limited money has a uh, rations, just by the nature uh, uh, of it. And so we're going to have to get a better look, not only uh, judging the medical technology for medical effectiveness, but also for its cost effectiveness. That there's a new fiscal scarcity out there that's going to require a new level of thinking and a new le level of analysis. Uh, th there is a conflict between the subjects we're talking about here today. Um, pushing up the ceiling and expanding the floor. Um, Tom Starzl um, says in his biography that I'm the reason that he left Colorado. And I wrote this up in Health Affairs, actually. Tom, a true genius, was trying to push up the ceiling. It really was true. But I had, at the time, 700,000 Coloradoans that had no health care. Uh, no, it was not next on my priorities. So I believe that we're faced with three interrelated problems. Um, that we already, before my time, uh, we un as a society undertook uh, health care called Medicare and Medicaid, retirement income called Social Security, long-term care called Medicaid. And w there's a hydraulic relationship between these three. And whatever we spend on one, we don't have much to spend on the other. And we, all of these now, are simply fiscal time bombs. We don't fully realize how much we've indebted our children in these kind of programs. So our current expectations, our current medical practice, our current um, political dialogue has all been developed at this time when we had this massive transfer into health care, growing at two and a half times the rate of inflation, an unsustainable amount of uh, increase. And yet, that's what we expect out of a system because it's really hard to downsize expectation. Expectation of doctors, expectation of academic researchers, ac expectations of the public. So we're an aging society. We all know that. We're going to have to run a nation of 50 Floridas. Um, and, and that's good news. That's good news. This is 1900. This is 1970. This is 2000. This is 2030. No, nobody's ever run a rectangular society uh, before. 
but uh, here in 2030, there will be the baby boomers uh, and just not, not near enough kids to, to support the programs that we've, uh, we've undertaken. Um, when I, got, when I got out of college in 1957, the average American woman had like 3.6 children. It's now uh, two, right, at replacement rate. And that's just a vastly different world when you're trying to support social programs. So one person said we made a massive bet on the ability of our children to support the elderly, and <laughs> we forgot to. <laughs> I knew there was something I meant to do. But this is a wonderful news for us individually. You, we have more life, more health, more uh, years ahead of us than any uh, time in, in any human history. And it's, it, 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 it's just that as a matter of public policy, it's a nightmare. So it's a personal, uh, it's personal dream and a, and a nightmare. This is the current revenue that is taken by our tax system. And this, by the way, is before the Bush tax cuts. So they're not in there. And, and this shows, again, by 2030, the current uh, growth of entitlements will, in fact, only fund, the current level of re revenue will only fund four of our existing programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and other retirement programs, the VA, military retirement, things like that. Up here is, in the blue, this is interest on the debt, and up here is everything else we have to do in government. Up here is the Coast Guard, and up here is the court system, and the White House. <laughs> And, the, and, the, and all the other things that we have to do. So what do we do? Um, we've tied ourselves into what was one of the great social advances um, in the world, social insurance, coming from this guy, Baron von Bismarck. He's the guy that really set this idea that um, 65 was the retirement age. He set it in the 1886, as I recall, um, 1883. Well, life expectancy in, in Germany in 1883 was 47 years. Hey, it's actually sound. <laughs> but it's not the world we live in. We now live in a slow motion crisis. And nobody will, nobody will, will talk about uh, what the implications are. In 2030, there'll be twice as many elderly and only 18% more people to support them. That has consequences. There's your age, age 20 to 64. Um, and this is the, over, the growth of people over 65. Again, uh, it, it, it's a blessing for us individually. But what does it do to our kids and our grandkids? Oh, the first baby boom has come to collect Social Security. How cute. <laughs> um, you know, we're going to be, we're, already we have now uh, something like 10,000 people a day turn age 65. And uh, it is a debt bomb that we're leaving our kids. I figured, in fact, not only I figured, but the, um, the, the, the former head of the uh, General Accounting Office, David Walker, he says that we're leaving our children $65 trillion worth of unfunded liabilities, total debt of un unfunded liabilities. If the government would keep their books like a corporation has to by law keep their books, we wouldn't have a $13 trillion uh, deficit. We'd have a a $65 trillion deficit. Um, and because these programs last forever, this, this woman just died last year. She was our last surviving civil widow of a Civil War veteran. When did the Civil War end? 1865, a widow of a Civil War veteran? This is a young woman at na age 19, in about 1919, married an 86-year-old um, Civil War veteran for his pension, not his passion, I'm sure. <laughs> and, <laughs> but the, the long-lasting consequences of this, in 2030, Bill Clinton will be younger than Ronald Reagan was when he died. So you have these unfunded liabilities. This one says $53 trillion. This doesn't include all of the unfunded liabilities that we have in state civil service pensions and police and fire pensions. We have all of these ticking time bombs in our society. Um, and, and so, and we also have the most antagonistic uh, political atmosphere that uh, I've seen at least in my 40 years of watching. So costs must be controlled. It's been growing at two and a half times the rate of inflation. 
um, that when I started uh, in the political sphere, we spent 6% of our gross national product in education, 6% on events, 6% on healthcare. Today, we spend 6% on education, 4% on defense, and 17% on healthcare. Healthcare has taken most of the new money of uh, my generation. We put into uh, these kind of en entitlement programs. So in 1965, we spent as a nation the same amount on healthcare as we do education. Today, we spend the same amount on healthcare as we do education, defense, prisons, farm subsidies, food stamps, foreign aid. And it's just um, crowding out other important functions that we have to do in this society. And, and the genius of American medicine, people like you, uh, and, and I celebrate that, but you're coming up with incredible things that we, that we are now called upon to, to fund. And there's just no end of things that are there that are going to be, um, come to the political system and say, well, how about us? You know, how can you be so uh, myopic that you're forgetting uh, our kid, our disease, our something? But Ultimately, we have to ask this mega question. Is there a North Star? Is there a gold standard we can ask? It seems to me there is one. How do you buy the most health for a society with limited dollars? Now, that's not your yardstick. You can spend the money however you want to. But if you're really going to say, now government funds over 50% of health care. I figure government funds about 58% of health care. We've already half socialized medicine. Well, that's a different yardstick than we, it's a different yardstick than how you want to spend your own money. So I think we should say, well, how do we keep a society healthy? This was my conception when I entered the Colorado legislature in 1966. But as we all know in this room, it's much more complicated than that. It's really a whole bunch of societal, technical uh, pollution factors that result in a society being healthy. So, Keeping death at bay has largely been a, um, a, a, a you know, public health. This is how I got involved in that whole duty to die in the first place. Um, you know, death is not an option. As Shakespeare said, we all owe God a death. Um, and, and so you look at, all right, well, how do we give people as much uh, as lifetime as we can? Um, it's not mortality we want to cure. It's, it's premature mortality. And so when you look at that, um, you have to ask, what do we die of versus why do we die before our time? And I think that's a very important question to ask. So if you ask, what do we die of, there's the list. We all know that. But if you ask, why do people die before their time with, with dreams unfulfilled, then it's tobacco, diet, and alcohol. So again, from a public policy standpoint, if you really are saying, well, is there a North Star that we can say, well, I'm heading in that direction, it seems to me it is, how do we keep as many people healthy as we can? So it's a whole different viewpoint. Doctors, tools, or medicine, but public policy can say health policy, a diet, smoking cessation, education, quality of life, all of those things make up a healthy population. And medical culture and, and ethics, however, demand that the patient advocate, uh, that, that the things that the public advocate uh, cannot and should not pay for. I'm about to make the argument that there's a part of medical ethics that, are uneth that is an un unethical public policy because it drives too much marginal spending, considering all the other things we have to do to leave our kids and grandkids a decent life. Doctors macro, micro allocate, public policy macro allocates. A physician reasonably can say they don't ration. I, I, that's, that's wonderful for them, but uh, as John Kitzhaber, and, uh, governor of Oregon, so well taught us, um, David Lawrence and I are both big fans of John Kitzhaber, is uh, he brought so much, he brings so much sanity to this debate. And, and he said, look, if you're governor of Oregon, if you are in the legislature of Oregon, you don't have that option. You, you know, that you have then the responsibility uh, you, to look beyond an individual at a time and say, well, uh, you, you can't say you don't ration because whoever is the governor of Oregon, Colorado, rations. Uh, doctors, they say, do no harm, but in public policy, we maximize good. Uh, doctors maximize a patient's health, but I think public policy should maximize the health of all citizens. 
Um, but yet professionals tend to believe that they are the only ones to make informed choices. Well, in fact, many of them, it's one of the things that makes a doctor great. It's nothing that I'm arguing with. The, the, the whole passion that makes a doctor a patient advocate is, is the right place to be. It's been that way for 2,000 years, but that doesn't necessarily translate into the fact that that should be public policy viewpoint, that we should just blindly fund every doctor's decision for every, uh, every patient. Um, so uh, the, the devotion of the physician to his or her patient may make it difficult for them not to seek an excessive share of available resources for them and to overlook the resulting loss to other patients. And that, I think, is the dilemma. How do we get enough public policy lateral vision to see the 47 million people, which we started down that road, but to see the big picture. Doctors no longer say cost is no consideration, but a lot of them believe that. And public policy, cost is always a consideration. I, I would be violating a law if I didn't balance the budget at the end of a year. Um, doctors focus on individual patients. Public policy focuses on citizens. Doctors ask, is it good medicine? But from a system, this is where people will say that the United States has the best doctors, the med best medical technology, the best hospitals, but we don't have the best healthcare system because a system is not just good doctors and good hospitals. They're indispensable, but you also have outcomes where we're fairly poor and access problems. So the New England Journal says U.S. patients receive proper medical care from doctors and nurses only 55% of the time, and we've got the 47 million people uh, that uh, at least at a given time were without uh, health insurance. So I think that these questions are of, 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 we have to think about the moral geography of a society that every, Every society has to decide somewhere on this scale. Are we, we're the most market-oriented, um, and, and as, uh, let's assume England is the most government-funded. Um, so what is the, the role of government? Well, we do spend over 50% of our healthcare budget is paid for by some level of government. And Victor Fuchs, wonderful, wise health economist, uh, paraphrasing a Abraham Lincoln, says, well, with respect to health care, a nation can provide all of the people with some of the health care that might do them some good. It can provide some of the people with all of the health care that can do them some good. But it cannot provide all of the health care to all of the people that might do them some good. So you, as you then ask, well, how do you keep a society healthy? It's very clear that we're our own best doctors. A great team of doctors, Dick Krugman is here from the medical school, at the medical school, saved my wife from breast cancer. I am immensely grateful to a good team of doctors. But most health hazards today are avoidable or minimizable by the individual action. What, in the past, it used to be that we would die from things that came outside us or get sick from things that came outside us, TB, typhoid, something outside us. But now, it is, in fact, our habits. And so there's a whole new level of questions that are being raised in base, start a baseball season to ask this question, but should have Mickey Mantle gotten the additional liver uh, transplant? He had a comorbidity factor and he was still drinking. So what is happening in other places is, as the London Telegraph said, uh, reported one in 10 hospitals now deny some level of surgery to smokers or the obese. Some advanced treatments such as drug-coated stints can, used to prop open will not be available to the obese. And it's really interesting. I have other slides that I've had to take out for this presentation, but showing the transition in Great Britain, because it isn't that they're trying to, to, to punish smoke, smokers at all. It's the fact that they're asking themselves this big question, how do we get the most health from our limited dollars? And giving smokers open heart surgery is, didn't make the list. You have the doctor-patient relationship of immense importance, but there's this universal dilemma in healthcare. And it's the fact that few of us can afford the cost of healthcare. If something happens to us in this day and age, it's expensive, almost inevitably. But yet people will always overconsume free goods. So we're caught between a rock and a hard place in our efforts to either reimburse 
or to uh, pay for uh, health care costs. We create uh, things that in forces that insulate people from the power of the market. And the third party payer system then encourages not only marginal medicine, it encourages medicine up to where the benefits approach zero. And so it's, it's called flat of the curve medicine. This is Victor Fuchs again. He said, when you start spending health, money in healthcare, you buy a lot of health for your money. But at some point, you get up here on the flat of the curve medicine. And this is where there's hardly anything that isn't beneficial. There's hardly anything that it, just a doctor walking into a room and saying, how are you, Mabel, is, is, is uh, you know, it's effective. It's, it's beneficial. People get, get better if they're asked after. But it's endless. Healthcare is undergirded by a moral tradition which systematically excludes reference to larger society. And uh, so the devotion of a physician to his or her patients make it difficult for them not to seek an excessive share of resources and overlook the resulting of other uh, patients, says the World Health Forum. So how do we obtain the most life and the most health for our, our citizens from funds that we have available? And there's, there's, there's never going to be an answer to that that isn't upsetting. Uh, we're, we're good f feeling human beings. There's no way you can make some of these decisions. Um, and, and then, and, and not only from pleasing everybody, but uh, without making decisions that are immensely painful. So we, they've started, however, uh, Richard Priester says providers should not do everything that maximizes the benefits of an individual patient since doing so may interfere with the ability of other patients to obtain other basic services. That's a new world. That's a new world of medical ethics. So I do claim that when you look at some of the marginal procedures that we do in healthcare and put them on uh, other ways, I mean, I've got 25 intersections here in Colorado that I could spend a million dollars a piece on and save X number of lives I mean, there's other things that we have to integrate uh, our dialogue into. And when some people um, come up with technologies that are so marginal, and yet they feel that they have somehow a constitutional right to be funded, a system can't have ethical standards, which will ultimately destroy the system. And I think our medical ethics right now will ultimately destroy the system because we have to enlarge our moral geography. Instead of looking at an individual, I don't want to say we shouldn't, we should not abandon that focus, but we have to look at the total population for, instead of informed consent and all of these others, there's a new con concept called contributive justice. I'll talk about that in a, in a minute, and distributive justice. So at this second level of health care, a health plan or a community, there is a different uh, allocation of funds than, let's say, a doctor at a time would bring to our society. There's a conflict between the health of the individual and the health of the group. So our current system maximizes demands for medical service with pooled resources, which insulates the system from people from the cost. So if, if, if we were all in the same health care plan, and we formed our own group here, and we all put in $400 a month, and we all drew out of it, and I wanted to get my PSA tested every six months because I'm cancer phobic, that would violate what this wonderful woman ethicist calls contributive justice, Javi Morheim, contributive justice. Because uh, if I want to get a CAT scan every time I got a headache, um, I am using resources that you desperately need and which we can put to make higher use in that. So she calls it contributive justice. So ethical issues in healthcare, when funded by pool funds, cannot be decided in the abstract. You must make sense in the context of other demands for those funds. And as Javi says, generous compassion for lamb is inevitably bought at the expense of all the rest of you. And it's called, it's, it, then we also, public policy comes into substituted mortality and substituted morbidity. Um, to public policy, cured means alive today to, to die later of something else. 
It's like what Phyllis Diller says about housework. She says, I hate housework. You have to wash the dishes, change the bed, sweep the floors, dust the living room, and then six months later, you've got to do the whole thing <laughs> over again. But it used to be that we died of infectious diseases from outside of ourselves. I've already mentioned that. But on, today, now, we have a contrast of these chronic diseases. And there will always be a 10 leading causes of death. There, it, like the most wanted in the, in the post office, you find one and you pull them down, and another one takes, takes its place. So um, preventive, everybody, both, one thing McCain and, and Obama agreed upon in the last election, we're all for preventive medicine. Well, I believe it, I practice preventive medicine. I don't think preventive medicine is going to save us any money. It's best for your health. But we all get sick of something. As Fuch Victor Fuchs says, we all have a, an expensive disease uh, at some point. And I, I believe the same thing applies to, uh, might even apply to, the, to cancer. Let me, before you jump on me, I think the statistics are clear that smoking saves government money. Um, there's just no question about it. Smokers die seven and a half years before non-smokers. They, they die at a time when they start to get hearing loss and new knees and hips. And it's not the way you want to save money, but it's not my point. The point is that we have to be realistic about the fact of that, that, that some of these things that we talk about are just really sort of step, uh, step houses, way houses on the way to other diseases. So if you cure cancer, how much is it going to be incre increase Alzheimer's disease and new hips and new, uh, new knees and all those other things that the body falls heir to? Of course, I want to cure cancer. I think we ought to. But the idea that all of a sudden this is going to save us lots of money is, I don't think, true. You do away with coronary heart disease and we'll find a large number of perceived less desirable deaths converted, uh, desirable deaths converted into much less appealing exits. When I die, I want to go quietly like my grandfather in his sleep, not screaming like the passengers in his car. <laughs> so I think we need some institution that evaluates medical technology. Health economists agree that technology advance has been the key driver of health care costs. There's an international technology assessment consortium, but of course, the United States doesn't belong to it. But the desire of an engineer to build the best bridge or the physician to practice in the best equipped hospital is understandable. But to the extent that that monotechnic person fails to recognize the claims of competing units or the divergence of his or her priorities from those of other people, his advice is likely to be bad public policy. The ceiling and the floor, again, we have to provide for both of them. We have to push up the ceiling. I'm not arguing with that, but it does seem to me from a public policy standpoint, again, John Kitzhaber, he has this wonderful metaphor. He says, we got to get everybody in the tent, even if we have to thin the soup. But it's more complicated than that. I'm really, I just lost my father. I'm 74 years old. I just lost my father two and a half years ago. Um, went through this with him, and um, you know what he wanted is low technology things. He didn't want big, some fancy technology medicine to save him at that age of life. He wanted Meals on Wheels and health education and information and referral, aging resource centers. This is what I would spend more money on. This is really important to the quality of life of people that we that, that we are in many cases spending much more money than we would spend here on some high technology um, uh, long shots. So in a world of limited resources, the decision to pay for one procedure for one group of individuals is an implicit decision not to pay for another uh, individual or another group of resources. Every, being in government is like sleeping with a blanket that is too short. You know, your shoulders get cold and you pull up the blanket around your shoulders and your feet get cold. Uh, it, it just happens that way. So there's a new world of trade-offs where we have to trade off preventative medicine with curative medicine, improve quality of life for an extension of life, young versus old, high-cost procedures for a few versus low-cost procedures for many, high-technology medicine versus basic uh, health care, and health care versus those other things we have to do to leave our children a decent society. This is Barney Clark, the recipient of the first um, heart transplant, artificial heart, 
And the budget for Humana and the artificial heart was approximately the same as the world spent eradicating smallpox. Well, of course, you're going to come back to me and say, and you're right, that, that that's a, a, a false equation in a way because the first one's always the most expensive. But medical research is developing more and more technologies which are available to fewer and fewer people, resulting in less and less health. We're doing more and more things at the margin. The most interesting day I spent in healthcare was in the, with a home health worker in London. And she, uh, my wife and I went around with her. She called on all new mothers. And she would, she would all women in Great Britain get uh, pre, pre, all the prenatal care they need, and they get three visits postnatally from this um, home health worker, for some home health worker. And so um, they've asked themselves this question, uh, how do we save the most mothers and the most babies? And it isn't neonatology. It's that question about let's get every woman pre all the prenatal care they need, and then let's have some sort of follow-up system, and that's why they do so well in mortality and morbidity statistics. So just because something is effective or just something is beneficial doesn't mean it's affordable. And if you think it is, I'm announcing today that I'm going to run for your school board. Wherever you live, I'm running for your school board. And here's my platform up here that I'm going to say we're going to pay for everything beneficial for, your, for our students in our district. And I'm going to have the, tell the teacher that they have a duty to, declare, to, to deliver anything that's beneficial. And I'm going to tell the teacher they have an ethical duty not to take cost into consideration. And I'm going to have you pay for it. It doesn't have the ring of a political campaign, does it? So the price of individual life is maybe too high a price for the health and life of society at large. And then Yogi Bear says, that's the most unheard of thing I ever heard of. <laughs> OK. But Harold Varmus had a really wonderful statement. He said, but, you know, we have a problem in this country, is that there's nothing that people place a higher value on than a healthy life. But he said, I'm concerned about two things. And then he goes on to say, I'm concerned about how much we're allocating to health care and the fact that we're now researching things that there's no hope. He says that there's just no hope of being able to provide generally to society. So medicine should, I would suggest, reorient itself from preserving biological human life to sustaining meaningful personal life. I'm not going to tell you this, this one, um, uh, but you know, I would think that even the passage of end-stage renal disease was unethical public policy. Let me make this argument. At the time they passed end-stage renal disease, you, know, you had something like 35 million Americans that didn't have basic health care. Should the political system have, have, have laid that at least on the scale? So Fuchs's, Victor Fuchs's iron law, we all get expensively sick eventually. In conclusion, I believe that we really have to say we have access to all to a basic level of health care. We need a, a means of limiting the use of procedures that are ineffective. That's sort of easy. It's not easy to do, but it's easy to say. But I believe we have to limit some that are effective, but just simply too expensive. There has to be some consensus on what those are. You're not going to listen to what I would think they would be, but you would have to find some procedure, like Oregon has done with the Health Priorities, Health Priorities Commission. We need to do limit something on malpractice suits, control of bureaucracy, and something on the total supply side of, uh, of health care. I end with this, a, a poem by what, who was once America's poet laureate. He says, praise without end the go-ahead zeal of whoever it was that invented the wheel, but never a word for the poor soul's sake who thought ahead and invented the break. <laughs> Thank you. We'll come down to the mics uh, and ask questions of the governor. So if mics are set up on both sides, or will be, I guess. I would like your opinion on policing and enforcing behavioral changes. Many speakers talk about how many changes in, in healthcare can be achieved by uh, behavioral changes. And um, I would like to phrase my question as an example. If I'm driving my car with my twin daughters in the back without a safety belt, police is going to stop me ticket me. Uh, if I do it again, I may lose my license, do it again. Social services may knock on my door and take my kids away. But I can park that car, windows up, smoke a pack of cigarettes, and then feed them every day junk food for 10 years. 
nobody can do a thing. Yeah. And the science is very strong, both for safety belts, secondhand smoke, and high-fat diet. So, so what makes safety belts enforceable? And secondhand smoking, not. Or feeding junk food, not. Yeah. Where, where, how can we create these policies and enforce them? Why, why don't we put rubber have a law that say you have to have a rubber bath mat in every uh, bathtub in America? Well, you know, and then we have a, a, a bathtub police that we, I mean, I guess it's a certain matter of trying to know when it's intrusive on, on, you know, on just the individual. It's sort of a right of privacy type of thing. And I think that you, it's been a real problem in motorcycle helmets and, and seatbelt laws. But I think we've come up with a fairly good balance. But um, it's very difficult. It's just unenforceable. It's, a, it's just unenforceable. It's a good question because, I mean, morally it's about the same. But making sure that millions of drivers have a safety belt on will be unenforceable. Um, <coughs> and, and that checking the speed of you know, hundreds of thousands of cars will be unenforceable. That is. So is, is, is yeah. that really yeah. is enforceability? Yeah, well, it, it, the first step was that if you would get a ticket, an otherwise a ticket, so you couldn't stop somebody from, uh, for, because they didn't have their seat belt on. You had to find some other offense. But now, that in Colorado, we've gone that next step and say if they see you driving without a seat belt, but I think you know the law, in a way, has to be wise enough to know what to ignore. And I, I think that they do pri prioritize, and they don't really stop everybody they see without a seatbelt. But it's working. More and more of us are wearing seatbelts. So, so, so the alternative could it be that rather than punishment, we need to reward good yeah. behaviors? I mean, can can we get a tax credit for lean people? West Virginia, a number of the problem comes in Medicaid. Is what can you demand of a Medicaid mother to get her kids vaccinated, to get some follow-up? And so in Florida, they did. You get a hundred-dollar gift certificate to Eckhart's for drug things if you get if you do the, this regime that they have in. So you really are looking at a whole bunch of both carrots and sticks, and it's a it's again a key question. I think that obviously public policy much prefers carrots than to sticks, and I think that's the way most states have, are going. Though West Virginia has recently passed something that has some uh, consequences to, the, to people on Medicaid if they don't do some of these things. Yes, Jessica. Governor, I can remember when health care was, I think, 12% of GDP. Yeah. Is there a way to calculate a number, you think, that of, of, of what is, in fact, affordable for us as a overall? Clearly, 17% is uh, probably hot. Well, I would argue that when you, um, you know, as you and I have um, seen in our own lives, there's, I mean, there's so many um, lateral needs in this society. And I think that, you know, Uwe Reinhardt says that there, there is no magic number, but that ours doesn't met, meet even the snicker test because it's so ineffectively and inefficiently spent. And so he would say there is no magic number, but Ours is way too high given what we get out of it. But I go beyond that. I think we have to somehow answer your question, compare it with education and roads. We have so many needs in this society. And I think that, that we, we have to pay our debts, for one thing. And so uh, I would be very uncomfortable myself if we don't, within a few years, start to see it going the other way. And I would think that. Um, you know, when you look at other countries that spend uh, 11 or 12 percent of their GDP and keep their people every bit as healthy, I would hope that we would, you know, go to the mean in that way. I think you, it's very hard in government, as you know, to, or, or in anything, to yeah. achieve what you can't measure. Uh, so if you can't set a goal, uh, once we get to the point of getting out the obvious sources of ways, I, mean, there will, I think there will have to be some way to know what we can achieve, what we can sustain. As a you know, I inherited the world's largest creditor nation. I'm leaving my kids the world's largest debtor nation. I inherited a saving and investing society. I'm leaving them a borrowing and spending society. I inherited, you know, my mother and father fought a war and a depression, and they left me with a very little federal debt. I'm leaving our kids with this staggering federal debt. You bet. I mean, we, we've got to understand the full uh, magnitude. We are Greece. In, in the United States, we are Greece. In, in 2019, we will be Greece. So your comments about the increasing cost of health care largely focused on things having to do with the technology of health care delivery, more or less. But there's the other side, the social side. 
and that is that uh, in our nation we have 367 health insurance companies. And these health insurance companies are permanently conflicted because their first job is providing profit to their shareholders and their second job is providing health care to the nation. And, and I mentioned yesterday the cost by Harvard Medical School, if we reduced that number to zero, which would be difficult, uh, we would save the nation in a year $350 billion. So it strikes me that there are uh, much, there are really big other questions which yep. are not being discussed here. Right. And that's how health care is actually executed in our country. And if you really want to save uh, money and cut that number down from 17%, there might be better ways to do it. Right, right. Uh, uh, let, me, let me just put, mm -hmm. reinforce with what you're saying. Um, uh, I am really going out in, in sort of a big picture apropos, Larry and I, you know, what, what sort of wanted this. Um, it, it, right now, there is enough money spent on health care <laughs> to probably do almost everything for everybody that, that medical science has invented. It's really the fact that the new, new uh, ideas of spending money are coming at us, too. So I men didn't mention a lot of things. I just mentioned only in passing the lawsuits, and I think that there's outrageous uh, things. And the insurance companies, too. One of the things that they do in the Netherlands and Switzerland, they have nonprofit uh, insurance companies. And I don't think... If you're not going to go to the single payer system, right? You know that's a good compromise. It seems to me you make the insurance companies nonprofit. Right. If you look at healthcare, and this has been documented by other people, uh, and all the rest of the developed world, it's a combination of national health and health insurance, but it all comes in at five percent overhead. Health insurance, again, highly debated number, comes in at about thirty percent. Our, yeah. our socialized medicine in our country comes in at about 5%. Yeah. So, you know, there's, yeah. there is a, that's the, the elephant in the room which people are gorilla, don't talk about. But that's a huge amount of money is going right there. And that's a social or historical uh, judgment that our nation has made, which uh, got swept away in the early days of health care legislation, unfortunately. I, 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 I plead guilty to that. I really didn't adequately discuss phase one. I was trying, you can tell I'm moving awfully fast here, but that, that's, you're absolutely right to, to point that out. Lots of inefficiencies in our existing health care system. We don't have to talk about denying people quite yet. So I want to talk about how we would deny people, because I feel uh, a little at risk, and I think that um, the, the, it's, you're right, in the big picture, we've got to do something. There's, there's an inevitability of making those decisions, but the question is how do we make them well? And we heard yesterday about roughly a third, you know, $300 billion a year in end-of-life care, last six months. The question is how do you know it's the last six months? You don't. Right? Maybe there's a treatment that will give me another 10 years. Yeah. And so that those choices are extremely difficult to make. And we're living at a time where we have very minimal trust, not only in government, but in sort of institutional authority writ large. And uh, the question is, how do you build a system that really earns the trust of the people who are giving up, in some sense, a chance at extending their lives uh, in order to benefit others? Um, I, wonderful question. I'd love to, I'd love to come back. Now here, I'm invent, inviting myself for next year. I'd love to come back next year. <laughs> I had a lot. I have a bunch of slides that deals with that. I have some. I, I think I have some answers to that. There's certain that we can agree on, but generally the idea that Oregon has is that you set up some sort of priority system. The interesting thing about th this suggestion is I think there's five or seven countries in Europe that also set up a priority system, but unlike Oregon, they never pulled the trigger on, and of course Oregon isn't working out as well as people had thought. So it's the key question. Uh, you've got to be very careful because this is a society that um, is, is is often run to excess, and you've got to be very careful how you set priorities. But I think there's a democratic, um, fair, just system where we can work this out. So there wouldn't be no one answer. It would be sort of like a continuing answer. An, an example would be you know, a, a, a drug that gives you maybe two extra months of life if you've got a colon cancer at $40,000 a treatment. I mean, it, 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 it gets into that kind of uh, spe specificity. Uh, sp speaking as a healthy, tax-paying immigrant, um, I wonder if, Im if encouraging, uh, dra dramatic in dramatically encouraging immigration of young, healthy workers to support our top-heavy population, will it ever become part of the agenda for solving um, some of this issue? Well, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't think so, but you know that I, um, I have some skepticism about that whole area, but that. You know, you don't fit, fix a Ponzi scheme by adding more players to the Ponzi scheme. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it, 
it, it well may be that we want to do some additional immigrants, but I think they ought to be for the skills and, the, and, and, and uh, level that, that they have. And I think that you've got to be very careful about saying that that's all of a sudden going to solve the social insurance, uh, this, this whole question of the triangle. Yes, ma'am. I wonder what you think of regulating agribusiness that creates extra corn to dump on Mexico that with NAFTA encourages those 20 more million people that we have to insure that at the same time increases high fructose corn syrup that increases our diabetes rate so much. You know, one, one of the other things um, I'd, I'd really love to do is I, I have a presentation on the law of unintended consequences in public policy. And that's really true. In so many things that we've done, we've, we mean to do one thing and we ended up doing something else. I don't know about your specific uh, necessarily, except that agribusiness um, I think has a number of sins that are laying at its door. And, um, but, but um, I am frankly also confused about such things as NAFTA and whether or not, I mean, there's an awful lot of people, you know, NAFTA didn't turn out exactly the way that people thought it was going to turn out. So the law of unintended consequences, which all of which is means that I think that's the right problem. I don't think I can answer your question, Larry. Um, so, so I'm worried about the uh, tyranny of the majority that makes rare diseases not worked on at all. And I wonder what you think of that. Well, um, boy, that's uh, um, the, the, uh, I don't see, well, this is the kind of thing that we really ought to dialogue on. It does seem to me that it's up to public policy to maximize, uh, the gentleman that said in answer to Pat, for one of Pat to Pat, Ask the question to one of Pat saying that the first box that you fill out on is the applicability to the general population. Um, I think that, uh, that uh, as tragic and as admirable as she is, it seems to me that box ought to stay in that application. We really ought to ask that question, what's the wider applicability that public funds ought to be spent in a way that maximizes public uh, health? And um, if, if not, uh, then w what we are getting into is whoever can develop the biggest passion. This is why we, you know, th that we have these uh, diseases du jour, where the breast cancer women will get up and they, and they will do this massive thing to, to breast cancer, but it's not furthering medical research. It's skewering medical research, because it's who's got the best lobbyists in Congress and who can do, put together the biggest marches. So I think that I would love to have a more thoughtful process than sort of who can tell the best horrible story. Boy, I didn't mean to end that way. Let me end this. There is no happy, you know, I. Do you mind if I make a comment? I don't. So I know oh. about, I know about the, the button and being checked about the application, but I'm also wondering in terms of return on investment, some investments that you make don't pay off today. So if you mm -hmm. buy stock in whatever company that's a small biotech and you're hoping in 20 years when your retirement comes into play that you make money. I think investing in rare diseases, and, I, and I'm not suggesting we make a disease of the month, but I think investing in pathways that affect rare diseases and common diseases is a worthwhile investment because the payoff could be quite big, not only for the rare disease indication, but for the, but for the more common disease. So I think that while we're looking at cost and we're looking at trying to examine the importance and relevance of that cost, I think we have to look at a, a longer, th uh, m something l less than immediate, the immediate application to a certain population of people. I think we have to look at a more um, longer term investment on the application that might well be in the small disease niche and might apply to the uh, more common disease later. Uh, the dystrophin pathway is one that's very common in, in dilated cardiomyopathy. It happens in children. It was the, the reason for my sons to die, but actually it's been really a blockbuster sort of approach for the National Institute of uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood. So we're learning a lot in those small indications that will be generally ap applicable. That if you would do a cost benefit at any given point of time, you might have never gotten the computer. <laughs> you might have got, there's a whole bunch of technologies you're saying that you, if you do a cost benefit on a 
on an immediate basis. It doesn't lay on the scale the, the ultimate. I, I mean, I certainly buy that as a, as a, a very powerful argument. But it, the, it can be almost applied to almost anything, though. I mean, you know, it can be, that can give, I mean, how do we, how do we divide a limited research bu budget? I mean, I agree that should be laid on the scale, but how do we quantify it? But you, in your talk, said that you would invest more in what your father needed, the, the, the things that weren't high techno technology driven. My mother is 94. She's in a nursing home. I consider it death row without the crime. So yeah. she, and she is yeah. stable, and I bet she lives to be 100, staring at a wall, not looking at TV, because not only can she see it very well, she can't interpret what's being said, f in, yeah. in, she can't yeah. process it enough. So, and I'm not suggesting we draw lines anywhere, nor, nor would I but, I, but I think we have to be really thoughtful in this dialogue about giving her more meals on wheels, as opposed to giving a child a uh, potential to reach the age of 35 or 40 or longer, and, and how that's all divided out requires very um, intense dialogue and very thoughtful, rational processes without just drawing the lines about rare disease. Um, hey, listen, your, your, your story is so powerful and you present it so well, and I think that I definitely agree. I happen to tap, took a slide out this early this morning which as if there is enough controversy going on right now, but which said, I think age should ultimately be a consideration in the delivery of health care. Age, age. I think that in fact, we owe a bigger duty to a 10-year-old than we do to a 90-year-old. In all great religious traditions, in all great philosophers, they recognize a difference between death after a long life and, death and a premature death. So I, you know, I, I do think there are a whole bunch of other things that we should discuss and lay on the scale as delicate as they are. Let me just end by this again, and praise that I didn't the go-ahead zeal of whoever it was that invented the wheel. But never a word for the poor soul's sake who thought ahead and invented the brake, and it's, brakes are tough. Thanks.